they really didn't like me. Um, it was a very strange interview. They didn't want to know anything about the academic accolades that I had achieved. They didn't want to know anything about the extracurricular. They didn't want to know any. And I, at that point, I built up this really impressive CV. It was always one obstacle after another. It was never an easy ride. And it was always just me having to constantly push, constantly prove myself. One of the researchers for Dragonstone had contacted us and said, would you guys like to come on the show? So we had to go through all the sort of like rigorous paper work we went on the show and it was like the most life-changing thing mm. I would definitely recommend it to any startups any brands out there because it's such an amazing experience I suppose you did say that you were not looking for investment so it was more about how can I tell the story of my product as opposed to trying to impress them I think we definitely wanted a dragon so I'd be lying if I said that we did we definitely did and like there is this one scene of me being like Simon tell them to go down because it was the offer that they didn't that they gave because you walked away from yeah, the Yeah, we walked offer. away. They did give us a, mm. an offer, but they just wanted too much. And, you know, they did the, the whole classic walk to, walk to the wall. And, you know, I was like, so I would make them go down. Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader, that your actions matter to those that look up to you? You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Rona, such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Yes, me too. Actually, one of my very, very close friends is a dentist. Oh, really? Yes. So I've kind of grown up with understanding a little bit what... Are you allowed to reveal the name? She's... Uh, you, you You won't know her. Okay, okay. <laughs> she's, uh, she's kind of based between... The, the US oh, and fine, Russia, fine, so fine, not here. London one, yeah. yeah, we grew up in in Russia together. Okay, nice. And ever since she was a tiny little girl, she's just always known that she wanted to be a dentist. Sure. So is that the same for you? So yeah, that's really a funny question because I get asked that a lot and I actually mm -hmm. wanted to know I wanted to be a dentist since I was 12 years old. And the reason is because I grew up in a medical-based background. So my father's a gynecologist, my mum's a nutritionist. All of my aunts and uncles are some kind of doctor and my auntie was actually a um, dentist and I found it much more enticing than being a doctor and I think for me there was this really this element of being able to build relationships with people because when you go to a doctor it's often because you're sick whereas going to a dentist you go every six months just for a checkup and I really liked the hands-on element and again I found with medicine that yeah you could qualify as being a surgeon but you don't necessarily do hands-on things whereas in dentistry you're very hands-on every day and I really like that element mm. of it so it was from a really young age was it the part sort of the aesthetics part of it that was appealing as well gosh no I was awful at art <laughs> awful Wait. and you know it's so funny because I think that within my character I always have this sort of drive and ambition to prove people wrong I'm not necessarily the most talented or the most academic I had to work really really hard at school and I remember that one of the caveats to applying to dental school was that you had to demonstrate your manual dexterity which means that you're good with your hands and I was awful at art awful at musical instrument like didn't play anything and I actually joined a jewelry making class in Hampstead so not too far from here and uh basically I 
joined it because I had to show during the dental interviews that I could use my hands. And I remember people thought I was crazy. And I was like, after this long day of school and at the time, you know, was studying for A-levels and so forth, I just had to go to these jewellery making classes with these kind of like 56 year old women. And it was like kind of cutting brass and stuff. And in hindsight, it was quite fun. But to be perfectly honest, it was my way of demonstrating that, you know what, like if this is what you want and this is what I need to get in, I'll do it. Right. So I don't know where I get this from, but were you really into drama at school? Yeah. So (sighs) the other thing was, is I think from a really young age, you'll find videos of me when I was like three, just sort of like (sighs) pushing my sister out the way and everyone and just being like camera on me. And I think you definitely see, you know, you've got your own kids. I think you can see from a young age, certain personality traits come out. For sure. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting because society still have a lot to work on where they put down certain characteristics and even schools of young people I'm sure that's changing now but you know if someone shows like being like a little bit of assertive or they want a little bit of attention you know I feel like adults tend to put that down but I think that again understanding that I was like that as a little girl was me sort of demonstrating some kind of leadership skills some kind of like need to be in media or something like that and my parents definitely let me embrace that and at school it was always like oh Rhoda's not very academic but she's good at drama but almost like she's only good at drama Mm. rather than this is something to embrace do you see what I mean like you know she might not be good at the other subjects but The funny thing was as well is that when I went to school, the secondary school I went to was extremely media based. And I remember the teachers like having no hopes for me being good at any of the very academic subjects. And as time went on, I just worked really hard to get better at subjects because I wanted to be a dentist. But I really loved my English teacher. And in English literature, there's a massive overcross with drama. So you learn about all the different Uh, drama playwrights and all the poets and everything like that and I really really loved it but all of the skills that I learn in those subjects I very much use today so I use that with my patients you know to understand them to analyze characters to really sort of have that emotional intelligence when I'm engaging with people also I found that it's when I watch films that are really abstract or you know I t- take my friends and I'm like let's go watch Chekhov or Harold Pinter and they're like okay they're like, really what's going on I can analyze it really quickly because my mind is just that way inclined so mm. I think it is interesting because you don't often meet doctors or scientifically driven people that are necessarily good at the arts and drama but for me it was such a big passion of mine when I was younger and I had to find a way to marry it mm. I completely resonate with that you know because because, really? Yeah, because when I was doing A levels, I took three. Well, you know, so talking about English and theatre study, so these you know have a crossover, and then biology, and everyone was like, "What a weird sort of combination of things." But I think people can have really interest in such different areas and you're right about the schools where you're not really kind of picked up on well if she's really good at drama maybe it's about you know being a good presenter or you know delivering a message or leading a A business or a team or you know a class and you're more pushed towards these sort of academic subjects because it's easier to grade somebody perhaps yeah and yeah I mean to you know when you're at that young age to be able to pick the different areas and then how do you combine them to create something new rather than just following a, path. a certain path yeah and I think you know what I was watching I remember this video went viral on like TikTok or Instagram or something like that where a young boy had come into the supermarket with his mum and I think he had Asperger's or autism and he displayed incredible organisational skills so when he was in the supermarket he felt the need to really organise these cans and created this beautiful display and the message of the video was imagine if we could instead of like treating these people differently use you know their special abilities as it were to create something in society and I thought that was such an amazing message because we're so sort of strict in the way things should be and the academic route and so forth we're actually we're all different we all can bring something different and actually we have something to offer in the world and that should really be embraced Mm. where do you think this comes from for you where did you realize that you wanted to do something different early on or is it something that kind of came later I think I've always been fighting really with society if I'm completely honest with you I think particularly as a woman but I think that I've always felt that you know 
society says we should do, be doing X, Y, and Z. We should be a certain way, but I don't want to be a certain way because the first obstacle wasn't school. So I got the grades to get into dental school. The second obstacle was getting into dental school because I went to this interview and I remember it was a really traumatic period of my life. I went to Bristol University. It was my first choice. I went in my fashionista outfit. You know, nothing's changed. And they really didn't like me. Um, it was a very strange interview. They didn't want to know anything about the academic accolades that I had achieved. They didn't want to know anything about the extracurricular. They didn't want to know. And you know, at that point, I built up this really impressive CV. But I could just tell they were not happy with what I was wearing. They were asking me like where I went on holiday, what my parents did. It was it was a really strange interview, and I didn't get in because with dental school you have to only apply for four um, four places. And then what happens is, is that you'd get offered, you know, a number of places based on the four and you always have to do an interview. So it's completely different for other subjects. So my mum said to me, right, when you go for your Leeds interview, so I got two interviews, so that was Bristol and Leeds. She said, you better just go completely plain. Don't go as you are. Don't wear any makeup. Have your hair really plain. Wear a black suit. And all you need to do is, is just talk about the NHS, for example. Like, don't talk about anything else sort of outside that and maybe like the scientific stuff that they may ask you. And it worked. But I pretty much wasn't myself in the interview, you know. Mm. But I had to sort of present in a way that I knew would get me into dental school. And the subjects that they talk about were very sort of topical at the time within dentistry, but nothing outside of that. And for me, again, I think that's just something that's wrong because subjects that we learn are so much more complex than what's just presented to us. You know, everything kind of intertwines in some way. You know, you've got your own business as well. It's not just about the management of the business, it's about the people and so forth. Anyway, that was an obstacle. Then I got into dental school and I found that I didn't really get on with the dentist because, again, they were very scientifically driven. They didn't get me. They thought I was really extrovert. They thought that I was really outrageous in my dress sense and so forth. <laughs> and I wasn't. So I found myself naturally being drawn towards those that did the drama, did the English, did those subjects that I loved at school. And I spent a lot of time with them, but it didn't really matter because I just had a vision. Left dental school and then you're meant to apply for a practice outside of your region. And, you, you know, I said, OK, fine, I'm going to go work in Kent or whatever. I wanted to come back down south. And again, the dentist that interviewed me, no one wanted to offer me a job, you know. So I felt like it was always one obstacle after another. It was never an easy ride. And it was always just me having to constantly push, constantly prove myself. But I think that I seek comfort in the stories that you hear about people, you know, people that have done well in life. They often say that talent has nothing to do with it. It's all about hard work. So I always know if I put in the work and have that drive and determination that I can achieve the things that I want to. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's because of all the obstacles that I had to overcome since a young age. Hmm. Do you think it comes from the fact that you were not born here? Like you came to the country when you were five, I think. Yes. Where, where did you go? Your up? research, Maria. <laughs> you do your homework, don't you? I um, did. Because where where did you? Where were you born? So actually, I was born in Saudi Arabia. So I think that, you know, you could say that it's a little bit cliche, but I come from your typical immigrant family. My father came to the UK with £10 in his pocket and worked in Spaghetti House. Do you remember Spaghetti House? I don't, don't actually, it, I don't no. Think it <laughs> and he was doing the dishes mm. and he put himself through medical school for a better future from the Middle East. And he then worked in the UK. So he did all his medical studies and he left at about 38 to get a job in Saudi. So at the time, Saudi was kind of like the place to be, a bit like Dubai now. You know, you go, you get an expat job and everything is sort of laid <laughs> out for you. Meanwhile, my mum as well, she grew up in Beirut and she'd also been offered a job in the a hospital in Saudi. My parents met in the hospital. That's where I was born. And they decided to come to the UK because my father was like, I feel very strongly about my girls growing up in an environment and a society that's very liberating for women. They can make their own choices and they have all the opportunities because obviously when he grew up around oppression in the Middle East, he was so anti that and just really wanted to make sure that, especially as having a girl, that he gave us that. So it was me and my mm -hmm. sister at the time. My sister was born in Bahrain and then we moved to the UK. But I think definitely watching my parents and understanding their story, I 
felt like I had to work really hard. And I think that's just instilled in you. You know, mm. you told me as well that you're originally Russian. I think like there's something to do about working, coming from a certain background and then being given an opportunity in another country that makes mm-hmm. you feel that you just naturally need to work hard. I think especially when you come from a background where you didn't come from privilege, at least not in the beginning. Yes. And you see your parents having to work, having to make sacrifices and also seeing the difference between how you used to live versus how, you know, you could be living. Exactly. And I think this, you know, ha- having seen that firsthand where, you know, the, you, the, the work that you put in and the sac- sacrifices that you make can make such a massive difference. Yes. And I think that's, you know, that's something that will never be taken away. Yeah. But I wonder for you as well, I mean, you're saying that, you know, from your, your, your father's background and, you know, having a girl and, you know, being in a country that's more liberal. I wonder if you had to kind of stand your ground with him too. So, interesting (laughs) one. I, my father's always been very open, but I do remember initially when I was sort of 11, he was like, and there was the first interaction with boys and things like that. We got invited to an evening in or whatever. And um, my father sort of tried to like lay down these like really strict rules and he was trying to be it really. But I turned around, uh, you know, initially I started doing some snooping around actually. So I was like, oh, don't tell my dad, I say to my friends, or don't mention this. And then I realized that that wasn't the right way. And I think my dad was quite quick to realize. He said, I've made this choice to bring up my kids in the UK. Therefore, they will adopt things that aren't necessarily aligned with my culture, but I need to like embrace it because I want them to have that honest relationship. So I think that was like squished down quite easily. And it was the same with my sister. Like my sister's like very, very outspoken, very sort of woke you know very like I'm not gonna stand for this Mm -hmm. and she laid down some rules with my dad as well and even now you know if there's something that my dad says that's a little bit sort of you know baby boomer is that what they call that generation you know he he just well like no dad you can't say that that's not the way but I think generally speaking I have an open relationship with my parents and they're very open to new age thinking and so forth some some traditions they like to hold on to but I guess that's just their generation so I'm okay with that yeah I think going back to what you were saying you know not wanting to follow a certain path and not being taken seriously and having to dress a certain way I mean there's several female founders that I've had on the show who did exactly that one had to actually two of them had to even not go in themselves and send a man in to be able to like raise investment and raise funds and having to some extent sort of change yourself or downplay your certain qualities do you think that happened because you were female or do you think that happened because you looked different or what do you think were they making you felt like they were making judgments about you and you know mm. it's it's it, it's a really interesting one I was actually thinking about this on the tube this morning I think that'll always struggle in my dental arena and you know I always feel so honored when people like you ask me to come and talk on a podcast because for me my world extends so much more than dentistry it's about reaching the wider public it's about the messages as you said as a female founder as a female entrepreneur you know not just within the dental arena and I think that dentists still misjudge me you know they look at the social media persona they don't take time to understand the story and they make this massive judgment that you know oh she's got there just because she's lucky you know oh she works in private practice but I'm like guys I worked on the NHS for seven years and it was hard and I went through really bad mental health problems and suicidal thoughts and things like that. But I changed the narrative of my story because I knew the only person that could was me. But they just look at the gloss, for example. This is males and females, by the way. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's not necessarily for me personally, because I know it's a massive problem in, in employment between different genders, but gender's never been an issue. It's always been a wider problem. Yes, people have judged what I do and assume that I am where I am because of the way that I dress or the way that I look. Fashion has always been part of who Mm. I am. My mum is really fashionable. We're Lebanese. It's like we're born like literally like with a design outfit on, you know. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I've always loved it. And it's always been an expression of creativity for me. So I think that really... 
I am not going to dampen that because I think we shouldn't judge people for that. You know, you can wear whatever you like, what makes you feel good. If I want to wear something sexy because I want to feel sexy, I want to feel sexy. It doesn't mean that I'm not a serious businesswoman, mm. you know. If I want to look after my hair or diet ginger, which I've done recently, you know, <laughs> I want to do that. And I just mm. think that it should not reflect. But for me, more recently, I've been like, you know what, if people are going to make these judgments, they can make these judgments. But I have felt reserved at times, you know, I get asked to be on television, for example, to have be an expert. And I'm like, okay, I've got to make sure my nails look a certain way, my hair looks a certain way. You know, I once got told on a really big TV channel, oh, could you make sure that you don't look so glamorous? And I'm like, um, okay. But I'm also thinking like, these are my features, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes I put a bit of mascara on and do my hair and like, I have big eyebrows. I have big eyelashes. You like, are this glamorous. Is, yeah, like, I am. like this is my mm -hmm. like ethnic features. You know, mm -hmm. I can't make myself look more plain. And I think there's so much more to be done for that. But what I'm trying to say is really is like, for me, I think when people ask a question like you've asked, they always assume it's gender loaded. And mm -hmm. I haven't experienced that because I think I've experienced it from both parties. Mm -hmm. So I feel this is like a wider conversation that needs to be had for women. Sure, there are certain situations, I believe that you've got to present yourself in a certain way, just as it's appropriate. But I don't think that the way the dr you dress and look should define who you are as a woman. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard in the beginning, especially when you're trying to establish yourself because mm -hmm. you're still working through the system you're trying to you know figure out how you fit in and kind of going against the grain yeah. is a risky thing to do 100 percent. but if you're going to be judged i mean you you look how you look i mean yeah. what are you going to do put a bag over your head yeah, like you know yeah, what i mean totally. or you know could probably try and make it fashionable by the way you we can do <laughs> i'm sure it will <laughs> look working. fantastic on you but it's it is a battle for yeah. for women in terms of being the first thing that a person sees is your appearance yeah. and then being immediately judged on your capabilities. Yeah. And there's, you're right, there's definitely a lot that can be done about that. Yeah. But I think with women like yourself setting the path and, you know, kind of, you know, establishing that um, model that you can do that, that it's OK, that you can be successful. You are smart. You are you. Um, successful to and you can look the way you look. And actually, one of the questions that I had is like, how do you yourself handle that? Because that must be very hurtful to receive comments to say, don't look so glamorous. I mean, well, thank you. But also mm. it is it is hurtful. But in a way, I'm trying really hard to break stigmas and I think that I've been lucky enough to create a environment where I'm meeting more and more people that really understand the essence of Rona and really understand and you know when they get to know me they're like you know your superpower is your ability to talk to people your ability to relate to people you know that's created the practice that I've created and they recognize that I can translate that to a wider audience so for example with media opportunities for me it's not just about being on tv in fact the thing that really irks me is you know people are like I just want to be like I want to be a presenter I want to be on tv because it's fun I'm like what does that actually mean because I want to do it because I want to make a difference and yeah I can reach people on a social media channel but when I'm on tv I can reach millions of people mm -hmm. and that's really my goal because if I can help impact so many more people in the short space of time or empower them that's really fulfilling to me so I think that yes those comments might be hurtful but I am grateful for the newer generations so the millennials gen z etc because I feel like we are really having those conversations which say we cannot dictate the way people look we cannot dictate who they want to be what they want to be we have got to accept people exactly the way they are and give them equal opportunities and chances and mm. so I think that the 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 environment's changing and the narrative is slowly changing sadly within dentistry I don't think it is but I think that knowing I seek comfort in knowing that things are changing but I am constantly fighting I feel for opportunities I'm constantly fighting to be like hey mm. I'm nice I'm relevant you know like everything wasn't handed to me and I have mm. something to say where is the fight where is that coming from I think the fight really comes from that fear of failure. I think that I always worry that I'm not going to be able to 
do the things that I want to do in life. And what I mean by that is that I think that I want to leave a li- lead a life that was meaningful. So in some way, I want to know that I've had impact on people and I want to know that I've created a difference in people's lives. That started with my dental practice, by the way, because people said, how did you get on to doing aesthetic dentistry? And for me, I was your normal NHS dentist that did work that was good, but it was just, you know, day in, day out checkups or day in, day out treating like broken teeth and so forth. And of course, disease is at the forefront of all of our minds. We're healthcare professionals. Why I loved aesthetic, though, is that you had an opportunity not only to treat disease, but also to have a massive impact on the way that people felt about themselves. So you're marrying the psychological with the medical. So when people said, you know what, like the smile that you've given me has given me the confidence to start dating again, to Mm. lose weight, to start socialising, to go and eat in public. You recognise that your job is more than just like pulling out rotten teeth or filling a hole. And I think that when I had that vision in mind, I thought, okay, this is what I want to do, make a difference in my practice. And then I think the goalposts keep changing because maybe I also have a fear of lack of change. You know how people hate change? Mm. I love change. You're kind of going the other way. Yeah, Yeah. but for me, it's like, I'm so scared of staying the same. I'm so scared of looking at my life and thinking oh my god I haven't like moved like I've stayed the same for 10 years I don't Mm. want to stay the same for 10 years I think there's that massive fear of failure and lack of change and I think definitely like one of the things that's been really on my mind recently is motherhood and I know that that's Mm. something you do because I (laughs) recognize that puts a massive pause in your life you know and I think that that's perhaps why I've been putting it off for so long you know family is something I definitely want Mm. but at the same time I'm like you know what you're bringing in another human being into the world and suddenly that human being takes precedence and importance over anything else you know and it's really important to me that I'm providing that Mm. so I think that there is something to be said to just stopping time can stop for a moment and you know other things can take priority and it's not always about achieving 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 for yourself Mm. I'd love to you know this is a very 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 interesting topic because I feel like I went into motherhood quite suddenly to this I mean I know I've always known that I wanted to be a mother I just didn't you know have like a certain plan Plan. of how it was going to happen and when it did I knew you know I knew obviously you know how how challenging it is to raise kids I helped to raise my brother and sister who are 14 years younger than me and how I actually did not anticipate at all that my career was going to be impacted. I thought I was just going to continue doing things in the same way. (laughs) And I think maybe as a, because I was thinking of it this way, I think if I didn't, I just keep putting it off and putting Mm -hmm. it off because it just seems like such a, such a big thing, like such a big shift. And I think sometimes, you know, just kind of have to leap into the unknown. Yeah, of course. And know that it's going to work out, but it's definitely a challenge doing both. A hundred percent. And again, Mm -hmm. I think that there's so many stigmas that we still don't talk about for women. You know, for example, I actually froze my eggs when I was 32. And I feel like that was such a taboo subject because I was quite open about it. My father's a gynecologist. He does IVF. He has an IVF clinic. He was the one that advised me. And then like when I researched into it, I realized, you know, the number and quality of eggs is drastically different at 32 compared to 39, for example. And I thought, you know, know why not I'm in a relationship but you know if I need them they're there Mm -hmm. and I spoke about it and so many women reached out to me because there's so much like stigma and taboo around the subject of like freezing your eggs but in reality as you said you know women are prioritizing their careers they want to do different things they want to find the right partner like things have changed so doing something like that shouldn't really be something that's like hush hush we shouldn't talk about it we should have open conversations about it I also went on to find out how difficult getting pregnant was and how miscarriages are really common. And again, people don't talk about it. It's like women have to suffer in silence when they go through this stuff. I'm like, we should be having these conversations because it is biology, it's life, you know? And if we offer that psychological support and take away, you know, all of that narrative around it, all that shame around it, I think, you know, we'd be in a much better position. So Mm. for me, I think these, we have so much to talk about. And like you said, career is a massive thing what about the woman that wants to have a career and have children Mm -hmm. there's actually a really interesting show that i watch on apple tv i don't know if you watch apple tv it's called raw 
Have you heard about it? R O A R. So like raw, like raw. the lion. No, <laughs> no, raw. I haven't. <laughs> but I love watching TV shows with very strong Meanings. female characters. Yeah. Well, this is a little bit like Black Mirror esque. Right. If you ever watched Black Mirror, yeah. where it's a little bit dark, but it has a really important meaning to mm. it. And one of the episodes, every episode's different, just like Black Mirror. And one of the episodes is is that this high flying career woman, her the opening scene is she almost dies when she's giving birth because she loses so much blood. And the fast forwards her going back to work she's got one child and then she's got her newborn baby basically she's going back to work and she's really struggling because her kid's like I hate you why do you leave me when you go to work mummy don't leave and then she goes back to trying to be this like CEO position but another guy was like gunning for her job anyway she wakes up and she constantly wakes up and these awful bite marks and these bite marks get worse and worse and worse and she doesn't know where they're coming from mm. and in the end she has to she wakes up in hospital because the bite marks got so bad and she ended up collapsing and so forth and she ended up in this like support group with all these other mothers that had bite marks and it was the moral of the story was is that she was eating herself up inside mm. she was causing the bite marks mm-hmm. herself because she was really struggling with the idea of wanting the ceo position that she once had but also being a good mother and mm-hmm. constantly trying to prove that she could do both mm-hmm. and i don't know it just really resonated because i think that you know again like women are so capable of doing things nowadays but there's this really important other element that if they choose to go into motherhood it will detract or take time away it just will you know because I think there there aren't enough role models to show you how to do it because we're all following in the male CEO male founder male kind of leader who didn't have those challenges it's only now that men are stepping up and you know you know taking longer paternity leave or spending more time raising the kids taking them to school that has not really been happening until very very recently yeah so we as women only have one model really to follow and that's not going to work yeah. so we need more female role models like yourself like you know lots of founders on the show that I've spoken to that are you know carving that path and saying this is the challenges this is what you know how I'm doing it and to create different ways that you can be a woman be successful have a family and I think that's really really important and 100%. when you're talking about, and discussing it and and voicing those things you know and voicing that it's not always easy you know 100 you might be trying to film a podcast but you've got your kid like really sick with cowpole like yeah. next to you do you know what I mean you know I'm going to find <laughs> a video that my husband did who is you know the one who's filming all these podcasts about me practicing whilst breastfeeding yeah. for one of the podcasts and exactly that like, yeah. exactly there we go and we yeah. should be like really showing those realities because I think the only thing that we're seeing like you're saying role models and I'm struggling struggling to think because all I can see is like oh you know the, some of the mums on Instagram not all of them are like oh, cool had a baby bounce back hey I'm a size eight again mm-hmm. I'm like that's not a role model to me that's me like feeling pressure then to be like oh my god after I'm pregnant I'm gonna need to look amazing again mm-hmm. you know so it's it, I think it's really hard like I think we there's definitely a space to see that more raw side of things and seeing people be like okay cool I have this and actually I'm really struggling with Mm. this you know well like you said I mean it's 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 challenging to to toe that line because you know on Instagram or social media you do want to present your best self I mean to some extent that's partly why it's interesting and partly why you're doing that because it is you know wanting to have that even vision of yourself And, you know, when you were saying how how hard it was for you, you know, spending seven you know years with working with the NHS and, you know, you were talking about having, you know, suicidal thoughts. Yeah. Like, and it's it's something that we, you know, we still don't talk about that. Mental health yeah. issues yeah. are, you know, a challenge to discuss. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, dentistry has one of the highest suicide rates of any profession. Yes. So I think it's like number two. I think farmers are number one. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really, really high. So you're talking about that's even higher than people like working in the city and finance, which we, as we know, has a huge suicide rate. And the thing is, people don't have these wider conversations. Again, I was asked to speak at an event that was really successful last week, um, started up by a few friends of mine. And that was about mental health and dentistry, social media and dentistry. And the conversations, again, stayed within dentistry. How do we create this for dentists? How do we create this? And I was like, guys, you're missing the point. I'm like, because the general public should understand 
what dentists are going through. They should understand why you can't get a dental appointment right now in the NHS, why so many are leaving the NHS. They need to have those conversations with us. It's not just about the dentists, you know, because actually the general public get involved. There's more empathy. There's more understanding. Patients won't come in all the time and be like, no offence, I hate you, you know, mm-hmm. which is the most common thing said to, said, said to dentists. So... For me, I think so many more conversations need to be had and definitely like within different professions and different arenas. And I think really for me, it's nothing to do with about being a dentist or in your case, you know, a businesswoman or, you know, whatever career you're doing. Because actually we're all human. It's all about being human. So Mm -hmm. I think the more conversations we can have about humanity, we can connect together. Yeah, for sure. You talked about being in the public eye and going on television and having a purpose and... It's hard not to obviously talk about your experience on Dragon's Den. You were... Did you, you watch were, it? I, I didn't actually watch the whole thing. I watched oh, bits of it. Yeah. Um, but I, I will. I definitely will. Because for me, that's, you know, it's uh, fascinating. And I'd love to see you on it as well. Um, but you said that you were selected to go on there. Correct. So you were asked to go on there. Is that, did you go on? Why did you go on it? So I have a startup. I'm one of the co-founders of Parlor Toothpaste Tabs with two other dentists, Dr. Adash Thanki and Dr. Simon Chard. Um, basically, we got a message. So a friend of mine who I went to school with was working on ITV this morning and our PR girl also knew her. And she said, oh, I'd love to feature Parlor on Plastic Free July, which is an episode about all the products you can get, Mm -hmm. making switches. And there was a really funny video of um, Eamon having like a tablet, not knowing how to do it. But anyways, it's a sustainable tablet. So it's a toothpaste tablet, which basically you chew on, you wet your toothbrush and brush as normal takes 500 years for toothpaste tabs to toothpaste tubes to decompose so we created a sustainable eco-friendly toothpaste which is sold in reusable glass jars now we once we were featured in plastic free july one of the researchers for dragon's den had contacted us and said would you guys like to come on the show so i guess it's a researcher looking at different businesses and brands and so forth so we had to go through all this sort of like rigorous paperwork a um a rehearsal and so forth and eventually because of covid only two of us could go on so we decided simon and i would be the best fitting for that for the show and we eventually went on the show and it was like the most life-changing thing Mm. i would definitely recommend it to any startups any brands out there because it's such an amazing experience the entrepreneurs that you meet are so inspiring and of course you know the dragons like I think I've literally been watching Dragon's Den since I was like 15 so I love it you know and I really loved meeting them and they all have their own characters and you learn from them and you know being put in the spotlight like that and not necessarily like in a very sort of comfortable environment is great because I love being outside of my comfort zone mm. so push it is designed to you know get a reaction out of you and create that sort of tension and totally. nervousness how did you cope with that? You seemed so calm. I mean did from I? the from the moments Was that I, I did see calm than Simon because I'm gonna claim that. To be honest, I wasn't paying attention. Oh, yeah, you didn't see it. You didn't see it. Of course not. No, I did see bits, bits of it. Bits of it yeah, yeah. But you just came across as just so calm and together. And, you know, because it's quite intimidating, you know, with a whole panel sort of, you know, grilling you and, you know, having to answer the questions, but also being kind of on the spot. Cool, and collect, cool, calm, cool calm and collected. Yeah. I was like, oh. So... <laughs> Uh, I think that I knew what the brand stood for. I think I know I knew what we had to offer. You know, at the end of the day, we've got the credibility as dentists. So we knew that the product that we designed had to be good enough to offer to our patients and the general public because this is our names behind it. We're so fed up of the big companies saying, hey, promote us, promote us. And we're like, okay, hang on. You don't care about the fact that mm-hmm. it takes 500 years for toothpaste tubes to decompose. You don't care that 1.6 billion end up in landfill or oceans every single year. We care. So we're not going to be part of this movement anymore you know and we knew that our mission was really clear also because we weren't particularly looking for investment it was more because we wanted the exposure on the show for people to understand and hear our message as I said to you why be on tv well we talked about parlor on our social media channels but if a lot of new people could see the product and could switch from a toothpaste tube to a toothpaste tablet Mm -hmm. that's good enough for us Mm. So definitely, like, I think understanding our mission and why we were there really helped keep me calm and focused. I also knew as well that 
whatever was thrown at us, we prepared so much that I felt ready, you know, for whatever they had to ask. Yeah. And yeah, I guess that was it. But I have to be completely honest with you, Maria. I actually don't get nervous on television. I don't get <laughs> nervous. And I guess maybe that's the bright drama side mm-hmm. of me. Public, public speaking, even like, oh my God, like, how did you feel talking to this room of like mm. 2,000 people? I'm like, it was fine, you know? I think it's less about the, the, the public side of things, of being, you know, in front of people. I think it's just more about, I suppose you did say that you were not looking for investment. So it was more about, well, how, what, you know, how can I tell the story of my product as opposed to trying to impress them because then you can just be completely I think we definitely wanted a dragon so I'd be lying if I said that we didn't we definitely did and like there is this one scene of me being like Simon tell them to go down because it was the offer that they didn't that they gave us you walked away from yeah we walked away they did give us Mm -hmm. an offer but they just wanted too much and you know they did the whole classic walked walked the wall and you know I was like Simon make them go down (laughs) and but I think that I just wanted a dragon because that's just part of really feeling validated you know like oh you know like they believe in our product but to be perfectly honest with you I think and I was so new you know I was so new like I'd never created a product this was so out of my depth creating a product putting it in front of people that I was like okay like if we have a dragon that means the whole business will boom you know Mm -hmm. like we weren't looking for the investment but I was like a Mm. dragon is gonna make us fly off the shelf in it but actually later on we learned the dragon just gives the investment but you still need to drive the business Mm -hmm. in the way that you see fit you know so when I understood that I was like but we didn't really need the investment you see what I mean so but I definitely did want a dragon at the time I think that I just, yeah, I just thought they were the ones, they make everything work. You have a dragon, they know everything about everything. But at the end of the day, they're business people. Mm -hmm. They know how to drive certain businesses. It doesn't mean that every business that they've ever had or invested in has done well. Yes. One of the other founders on the show, she told me that she chose to walk away from an investor. And at the time, it felt like it was a mistake. But in hindsight, she said that was actually the right thing to do. I mean, do you look back now and do you think that was the right thing to do? Or do you still kind of like, do you, totally, do you have any regrets? totally resonates with what she's saying. So why do I resonate with what she's saying? Because I came back and I was like, oh my God, we should have gone with it, even though if we were going to give 30% of our business, which is a huge chunk of the business, mm-hmm. called my dad classic because I love daddy girl what did he say being a middle listener call Deborah tell her you made the mistake I'm like dad I'm not calling Deborah you don't tell her that, you know? and it was only because again my mm-hmm. dad being like old school didn't really understand but I think now with where the business is at today I'm like we actually didn't need them mm-hmm. and we it's so good that we didn't give away so much equity so definitely I think it was the right decision mm-hmm. what do you want to do with the brand now You know, for me, as I said, my whole ethos is making a difference, right? So for me, if we can get more and more people to convert from tubes to tablets, that is huge. You know, I'd really, really, really love to see that. And I know you've had some incredible entrepreneurs in the startup space. And again, for them, it's about challenging those, challenging other brands. Mm -hmm. Why are people doing it a certain way? You know, I think that we want people to stop like every time you open up a toothpaste tube, you think, why am I doing this? Like, I want to be using Parler. Parler's to be a household name. Toothpaste tubes are be to be replaced completely by toothpaste tablets. And Parler is definitely, you know, the start of that movement. We are in some major retailers now, which again was a massive achievement. We did that all without Dragon's Den. So I think that I'm really proud of where the brand is going. But there's so much education awareness. And I think I want toothpaste tablets just to be the norm for everyone everywhere. Hmm. It's true. I mean, just listening to you and letting it sink in to say 500 years, years. A single toothpaste tube to decompose. And you know, I didn't know ones. that, you know, like, do you ever get the sample ones at the dentist or like, you oh, know, yes. when you buy, go to the airport and you go to boots and you're going over the weekend. So you're not putting your, yeah, they're very cute. <laughs> but you know, those tooth, imagine that lasts yeah. you what, four days and that's yeah. 500 years on our planet. Yeah. And you know, turtles and all these beautiful creatures are mm-hmm. choking on these like little bits of plastic. It's just, horrible mm. and I hate it because I feel really guilty mm. you know like I can't have a play sometimes I forget to take my carrier bag to uh, the supermarket and you'll see me like with just carrying all the stuff because I just won't take a plastic bag you know yeah. we should be thinking about that with mm. all elements mm. and it's not about making crazy changes all at once and I think that that's the thing you know you get a lot of people being really put off being like I'm not going to change everything in my lifestyle but if every single person makes one small change a day that's going to you know accumulate to the greater good in the end mm. 
What's been the hardest thing for you being a co-founder in a brand? I think it's always really much more challenging working as a team, especially when you have founders that have equal equity in a business, but everyone has their own version of what they bring to the brand. So I think that, for example, we are really lucky because we're all very different. Like we've got Mm. one that's massively the finance guy, one that's more in the kind of like marketing networking, networking, one's more the like logistical I love the detail. I love to speak to the retailers and so forth. So I think we've got, we all bring really different elements, but sometimes that can cause clash because the way someone may do something is not the way another person does things. So I think that naturally I'd describe mm-hmm. myself as being more creative. So like I hate Excel spreadsheets and I hate PowerPoints. Yeah. So when they want something on Excel or a PowerPoint, I'm like, I'm not going to do it because I literally seize up, you know, but that's because of the way that I'm creatively inclined, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think that sometimes there's difficulty in different personality types with the way they do things but I'm grateful for that as well because I'm like the people that are really good at the creative are not so good at the logistical you need the logistical stuff you see what I mean because Mm -hmm. it's really important so I think that it is difficulty sometimes making one another see each other's values and that's Mm -hmm. not often but that's just you know like why haven't you done this and have you done this in this way but Mm -hmm. other than that I think we make a really good team yeah how did you how did you find each other well because we're all dentists and we all work within the dental arena we always knew each other from like events Mm -hmm. and so forth and I think because we'd always been approached by similar brands hey do this campaign for us or hey do this for us or hey talk about this Mm -hmm. so we'd naturally known each other through the kind of dental networking scene and Adash had approached me saying would you think about doing a product at some point and I was like well it's really funny because Simon's approached me about exactly the same thing so I said let's all have dinner the three of us and then that's how it started Mm. talking about how everyone's got different opinions and different skills that is actually really really important because you don't really want to be doubling up but it is difficult when you just say well can't you just see it from my perspective but I think it's that creative tension that really makes a business really successful as long as you are unified in what the purpose of it is is. and you can accept each other's differences and different perspectives um i guess what makes it more complicated the more founders you have in the business the more that dynamic is becoming more difficult to to manage but for sure and I think that we've all grown to love each other's traits that we don't necessarily align with 100% at the beginning uh it's also been challenging because we all are full-time dentists Mm -hmm. so we all run our own dental practices so we have an amazing managing director at the moment which has been a massive game changer so I think you definitely the more auxiliary people that join the business Mm -hmm. you're like grateful for them you know because I think the startup at the beginning is always really, really hard. You know, when you're trying to find your feet, you're all doing bits that you don't want to do, but have to do. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah, I think the business is really definitely growing in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And it's just so different for us from normal dentistry, like running a practice we know how to do now because we get patients. I've been geared to do that for years and years, but Mm. startups are always just completely different landscape, different people. So I think... It's been some, it's been a journey, but we're all loving it. Mm. How are you handling both? How are you managing to run, you know, your dental practice, having a brand, social media? How do you do it all? (laughs) Social media comes really natural to me. I don't consider it to be work. I'm really Mm -hmm. good at just doing content days so for example with content days I will put one day a month film out a load of content videos photos etc so it means I have a bank in my kind of like drive folder so should I need to do I have my set days that I post so I don't find it stressful at all I'm kind of in the rhythm of that um tiktok i love at the moment i feel like tiktok is the future she don't follow you on tiktok oh my god I'm i have to go so, and find you, you know what i love about it it's so unpolished mm-hmm. you know people don't want to see your a role you know someone said they want to see your a side someone said this yesterday at talk but they want to see your real authentic b side you know yeah. and i love that be real and for me tiktok is amazing like that and again because it's such throwaway content when you say i could literally be in between patients and be like da 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 and then mm. put my phone down Paula has, you know, we have set days that we work. At the moment, some people can give up more time than others. But I say it's thanks to all of our other staff members that have come along that have kept everything going really well. And the plan is for me to give up more clinical time to work on Paula as well. But because I bought my practice in 2020, 
a week before national lockdown, mm. I had to create an, a business that was going to be sustainable without me in it. So being the face of my Dr. Rona brand, the clinical brand, it was really hard. But now I'm in a place where I've got amazing dentists working for me so I can step back a little bit mm-hmm. and then be in the office with Parlamore. Mm. I mean, you come across as someone who is like very, you know, it's all about sort of, you know, future focused, you know, very, very polished, very kind of calm, determined. Is there anything you would change about yourself? 100%. Uh, anything, <laughs> one thing. Can I, can I choose a lot of things? Mm. Oh, there's so many things that I would change. I think I definitely have an element of not being able to be present. It's it's something that feedback that I get from a lot of people. Mm. And I really, really struggle with it. And it's so funny because I've invested so much time and money understanding about how to be present. And I've got all the tools in my toolbox, but it's almost like I don't want to do it because my default is not to be present. So for example, you might be talking to me Maria, I don't know if it's happened during this podcast, and I'll completely zone out. And some people have thought it's rude, but people that know me really well will be like, get back in the room, Rona. You've left the room, you've left the room. And I think it's because my mind is like thinking, like, have I done this? I need to do this, all this, 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 and this. Mm. And I find it really hard to stay in the present. And I think, you know, a lot of people suffer with that, but I definitely think mine is heightened to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I think that that's not great because it can also, it translates to all elements of my life. So whether that's friends, family, staff members, et cetera. Um, Not so much patients, I think, because you've got a certain amount of time with a patient in a room. But I think definitely that's translated. And I don't like that about myself because I'd love to be totally present in the moment Mm -hmm. I find it really hard to just turn my brain off as well so I kept saying I really want to manifest like working two to three days in clinic (laughs) and I just want to be able to do other things in my life and like for example I was long story but I was meant to be in Japan this week for work and because of restrictions and everything like that I couldn't make it to Japan and I I said to the girls, oh, okay, well, open me up in clinic. They said, well, no, all, your, all the rooms are full now because you were meant to be in Japan. So this is why I could do the podcast today. So I was like, oh, so I woke up this morning and I just felt like, oh my God, I need to do something productive, do something productive. And like, I went to the gym and then, you know, obviously got myself here and I'm like, what do I do for the rest of the day? I need to be productive. And like, I haven't done this, like finding stuff to keep myself busy. Mm. Whereas like, I still have, I mean, I still, I've definitely become better at resting, but I still feel that even if you're resting, so for example, even if I spent the day at home, I'd need to do something on my laptop because resting to me is not moving around or not going from A to B, but it's not rest. Do you see mm. what I mean? So, and for me, resting is always escaping to another country where no one can bother me and I can't physically do anything. So I think definitely being able to change that. And I think the other thing is, is I'm really impatient. So I feel definitely the most impatient person I know. So sometimes I put pressure on people. So I'm... I would like to think I'm a nice boss and, you know, my team members love me, but mm. I might delegate something. And if it's not done within like an hour, I'm like, why hasn't it been done yet? You know, and I won't say it in a way that makes people feel angry or upset, but I'm kind of like impatient, but like in my mind, I'm like, why haven't they done it yet? Recognizing that people don't need to respond to everything immediately. Mm. People don't need to, you know, it's okay to take your time on things. So I think there's definitely that element of impatience. And also why hasn't this happened yet? Why am I not here yet? Why, 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 mm. why? So I think those are the three main things. Mm. Talking about leading a team and being impatient, like what does leadership mean to you? Leadership is absolutely everything. I think it's, it's so imperative to a successful business because I think that if you are at the top of the pyramid people look up to you right but leadership is making people feel completely equal and valued at the same time so for me when I lead a team like in my dental clinic I want every single person to feel comfortable and that they're just as important as the person next to them and that's real leadership I think because you're not making anyone feel like there's a hierarchy or that you know someone matters more than another person that's really important to me but also it's about having a vision right so if you've got a vision and everyone is aligned with that vision you then achieve more I think definitely as a young female boss it's been very challenging because I also have people in my team that are a little bit older more mature Mm -hmm. men etc 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 and sometimes it's really hard because I'm like I don't want to be the like scary mean person and tell Mm -hmm. them what to do and I'm trying to find that balance now being like how can you be assertive without being a horrible person you know so I'm still working out that balance and I definitely think that when I look at the leaders that have led me or the leaders that I look up to for me it's somebody that really knows how to 
get everyone on the same level as you and to achieve your vision, if that mm-hmm. makes sense, mm-hmm. you know, because you think about people, for example, like Steve Jobs, I wouldn't say he necessarily displayed great leadership skills. Yeah, he was iconic. He created a massive movement. He changed the world. But often people say he was a micromanager. And being a micromanager isn't a good thing. You know, his team found it really difficult to work with him. And that's not the kind of leader I'd want to be. You know, that's that's an innovative thinker. But a leader is somebody that really, the team feel like they want to do something for everyone else because they all have one goal and vision in mind. Mm. That was super complicated, but I think you know what I mean. No, I do. And I, going back on the the women leadership aspect in terms of wanting to be liked, and there are studies to show that women are perceived as less capable if they're not kind and I think there is this discrepancy whereas if you're you know a bit abrasive and even rude and you're a man you're considered a great leader as opposed to a woman who we we do prioritize women being more soft more kind of like more pleasing and Mm. I think there is a mindset shift that needs to happen too because I get the point about you know kind of getting people you know on the same page but you it's, I don't think it's necessarily about being nice. Mm. I think it's about being respectful and about, you know, understanding that everybody else is a human as well. And, you know, having that, that empathy and that kindness, but also sometimes you need to be delivering a tough message too, but in the right way, not in a kind of yeah, abrasive I, I way. Think, I think it's really hard because I often, I think to myself, and it goes back to the very first thing that you and I discussed at the beginning of this conversation looks is so intertwined right you often think about it like there's sometimes some amazing female leaders it's so rare for people to embrace you know whether they're like so aesthetically beautiful to look at which shouldn't matter at the end and a really powerful dominant figure you know like I'm finding it really hard to think about someone in society and I think that people often don't they find it really hard to kind of like equate one with the other because it's almost like they can't coexist together, which Mm -hmm. is totally, total nonsense, you know. And those that have demonstrated both have been somewhat been perceived to be weak or they've ended up being killed off by society. You know, someone like Princess Diana, who arguably had both, you know, she had the beauty and the brains and the leadership and so forth. But, you know, she showed so many signs of suffering, you know, so it, it's a really hard one because I think that definitely there is that room to for women again to be like I can have all these qualities. You know, mm. like everything is nuanced. Two things can coexist at the same time. It's about being authentic to yourself. And whilst in the past, you know, you, you we always brought ourselves to workplace. That mm. always has happened. But I think the shift now is that we are more open about it and we want to discuss it. Uh, whereas before it was just something that you know you kind yeah. of try to pretend that it's almost not there so again it's about having those open conversations sure. with regards to you I mean this is a question I love to ask towards the end what seems impossible to you now but should you achieve that that will change the course of your life or your business oh my gosh <sighs> I think what would seem impossible to me would be to franchise my dental clinics. So not to just have one or two, because a lot of dentists do, but to have a proper franchise, it seems so explosive to me. But the more female entrepreneurs I hang out with, like I've got some that have done this sort of thing, like business on like a global scale, or like they have their business running in so many different parts of the UK. That seems really impossible to me because I'm like, how could you just manage it? If something like that were to happen, I think it would completely change because it means the business isn't just in your hands, right? It's in like, it is to an extent, but you're relying on a lot of people and a huge, huge team. But it also means that I could step back from what I'm doing mm-hmm. in terms of like running a dental clinic because everything is on a small level now, which I'm super proud of. Mm-hmm. But it's just on a different level for me, you know? And then I think I could align myself to some of those really great business women out there. Mm. But yeah, I think that would probably be it. I would have said maybe like two years ago for Parla to be a household name. And, but I think, you know, I have a good feeling like that sort of thing is happening right now, you know, Mm. we're in the good for trajectory. And I think with sustainability and all the eco conversations we're having, people realize they need to change. So Mm -hmm. I feel quite confident about that, but I think definitely 
that seems impossible. Don't say that to me because now I'm going to feel like I have to achieve it and have this conversation with you in like five I'm just, years. you know, planting seeds yeah. in your mind. But um, You're helping me manifest, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to have so you on the much. show. Yes. And uh, love talking to thank you. Thank you. I'm thank so you. honored to be here. So thank you oh. so much, Maria. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on YouTube or reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe or follow buttons and I'll see you next week.